I'd now like to introduce Jean-Luc Marguerite. Yeah, okay. Uh, okay. Jean-Luc Marguerite is uh, someone I've had the privilege of working with in the International College of Office Gynecology over the last two decades. He's the president of that uh, international society. He's currently president of the French Corposcopy Society, and he's probably the most famous hysteroscopist in Paris, along with Jacques Camus, who I think you work he's very still, closely he's with. Still working. He's still working, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, also, it's not often that I get to uh, work with somebody who has the Légion d'honneur, which uh, Jean Luc has, which is a very, a very real honor in France. And you don't often hear about it, but you can recognize it because if somebody has the Légion d'honneur, they have a very thin red thread in their lapel, which you will see on Jean Luc. Very understated, very un British. <laughs> so, without further ado, I'd like to welcome Jean Luc and ask him to give his talk on myomas and suffrage. Thank you, Jean Luc. First of all, I would like to, to thank uh, Walter for his kind invitation here in Dublin and all the medical staff which organized this meeting about uh, office or our patient hysteroscopy. And first, I would like to apologize for my poor English because you know, actually, my mother language is French. Then I will try to speak, but not as easily as the as the previous speakers, of course. Mm. Then I will try to explain you the impact of myomas of fibroids in uh, infertile patients, and perhaps show some uh, different method of uh, doing office hysteroscopy. And I introduce some slides to show how it works in our office department. Then, as you know, myomas are very frequent, of course, about 50% of well, the lifelong patients. But uh, in infantile patients, young patients, it's very, very uncommon, about 5 to 10% of patients, and it may be attributed, in the cause of infertility, may be attributed to myoma, only to myoma, in about 2 or 3%, which is not the main cause of infertility, of course. And we'll try to find which are the fibroids, which are in causing infertility. The mechanism of uh, interference with fertility for, for myomas will be enlargement of the deformity of the uterine cavity, which may interfere with sperm migration or transport. That's an hypothesis, of course. Modification of tubal ovarian anatomy, which may be more accurate. Disorder of uterine contractility, perhaps. Disruption of implantation, most cause of, uh, for some mucous myomas, impair endometrial blood flow or endometrial dysfunction or secretion of the vasoactive substance, but we doesn't know quite <laughs> precisely which substance are impaired in the presence of myoma. <laughs> then it's more theoretical than practical at the moment. If we are looking at the publication about fertility and myomas, we may see that all those location of myomas may impair fertility, and all of those are significant about clinical pregnancy rate, impatient rate, ongoing pregnancy, or spontaneous, spontaneous abortion rate, but not preterm delivery rate. And we have to know which kind of myomas it, it's uh, involved in those uh, decrease of fertility. If we are looking for submucous myomas, you know that submucous myomas are in impairing the uterine cavity. And then we do know that all those submucous myomas are modificating the clinical pregnancy rate, the implantation rate, ongoing <coughs> pregnancy, and everything. And if we are looking on fibroid with no intracavitary involvement, we may see that in the clinical pregnancy rates, the difference is not significant, but it's more significant on implantation rate, ongoing pregnancy, and spontaneous abortion. Mm. But if we are looking more precisely on those myoma not involving the uterine cavity, which may impair fertility, if we are looking more precisely at the studies, we may see that whole studies shows a significant influence of myoma, even intramural fibroids with no, with no intracavitary 
proportion. Whole studies shows a significant difference in the pregnancy rates, showing a, a, a 81% of chances of loss, 90% of loss of chance of having a, a clinical pregnancy. But if we're looking only on prospective studies, we see that this is no more significant. And if we are looking studies using hysteroscopy in order to be sure that there is no an associated myoma inside the uterine cavity, then these intramural myomas are not longer significant. Then perhaps an intramural myoma is not improving fertility in normal patient, normal fertile patient. But we will see that for, for example, IVF patients, the things will be a little bit different. Then. In a, a course studies showing for normal patients which have been pregnant, what is the responsibility of myoma of the time of between desired concession and the pregnancy? We may see that the presence of a lyoma, a lyoma present or not, there is no significant difference between the time of concession, patient which has been pregnant and which has uh, a myoma. Any location of the myoma doesn't differ in the fertility rate. No fertility rate in the time during conception, time for conception. Conception. If we are looking the location in the uterine cavity or in the myoma segment, cervix, corpus of fundus, no significant difference. Even the number of myoma doesn't modify the time of conception. Then perhaps myoma are not so much involved in infertility. If we are looking on some meta-analysis, we may see that if we are looking all cap all uterine fibroids, not distorting uh, cavity, but for IVF treatment, which is some different patient from normal patient, then in IVF patient, the presence of even an antromial fibroid is associated with uh, 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 decrease of uh, fertility rate. If we are looking on young patient under 37 years old, fibroids is also associated to a decrease of fertility rates. And if we are looking not only for fertility rate but for pregnancy rates, then the presence of fibroids seems to decrease the, the, the pregnancy rate even in infertile patients treated by IVF. Then we may think that removing the myoma for those kind of patients may be useful to improve <coughs> the pregnancy rate. And if we are looking at some other studies here, an Italian one, we may see that uh, the clinical pregnancy rate in fem for female reproduction for submucus is associated with uh, a very important decrease of odd ratio. Intramural is a little bit less important, and subsural or intramural without any intramucous, intracapillary components, then there is no involvement of fertility for those myomas. And then some Italian studies show that show, they, they compare two kinds of, of, of patients. <coughs> 190 cases of patients who were selected for IBS with no fibroids and 190 cases with fibroids. And we may see that the number of clinical pregnancy were significantly, you know, were, were a little bit uh, improved in patients without fibroids, 38%, but it was not really significant because you may see that the confidence interval include one. And the number, the number of delivery was 45% higher, but then they conclude in asymptomatic patients selected for IVF, small fibroids, less than 50 millimeters, not encroaching, encroaching the endometrial cavity, did not impact the rate of success of the procedure. Then, if we are in front of an infantile patient with an intramural myoma, without any modification of uterine cavity, and if the myoma is less than 50 millimeters, we don't need to remove it. And 
we have to, to know if the treatment improves fertility if the patient is uh, boring a, a myoma. Then for submucal myomas, we are sure that if we compare a patient with a submucal myoma with a resection or without resection, then the clinical pregnancy rate will be twice after removal of the myoma. The ongoing pregnancy rate will be twice, but not really significant. If we are comp com comparing intramural fibroids, then there is no significance between removal of the myoma or not removing the myoma. Then, for intramural fibroids, we have to wait before we decided to remove the myoma. In uh, different studies, 200 women were compared with my hysteroscopic myomectomy or diagnostic hysteroscopy, my biopsy of the myoma to be sure that it's, there is a myoma, but not removing the whole myoma. And then, among the patients with cloth complete follow-up, in the study group with removal, 63% of women had a pregnancy. In the control, 28 the relative risk of having a pregnancy then is twice when you remove the myoma, and this is significant. Then, hysteroscopic myomectomy for submucous myoma is improving and <coughs> really modifying the risk of the chance of having a pregnancy as it is effective in achieving a better pregnancy rate. In another studies, we may show that women who underwent wonder what myomectomy, the pregnancy rate, were those in submucal myomas, 43. In women with submucal myoma without resection, the rates were 27. This was significant. In case, oh, sorry, in, in case of, sorry, in case of a patient with intramural myoma, the difference were not significant. In case of submucal and intramural, it was significant, and in patients with intramural or subsural myoma, then it was not significant. Then, the most important part of removing a myoma, it must be decided because the myoma has a submucous part, and this is significant, and the other myoma are not significant. There is also a technique to improve, to reduce the uterine size or the myoma size. It's uterine embolization. But in infertile patients, it's very dangerous to try embolization because you may embolize also the ovarian <coughs> vascularization between uterus and ovary. And then we may see that the FSH level for patient who has been operated and for patient who has been embolized then the, the result is favoring surgery because surgery doesn't improve the vascularization of the ovary. And if we are looking between embolization and uh, surgery for pregnancy rates, it's much better to operate the myoma rather than embolize the myoma. Then the uterine cavity is much better after surgery than after embolization. We did a study about 500 cons 560 consecutive hysteroscopy, which has been done in our department for infertile patients, only for <coughs> infertile. We are using diagnostic hysteroscopy as an health office of procedure, of course, during consultation without any preparation, any anesthesia, anesthesia nothing. And I will show you how we, we are performing that. The mean age of the patient is 35 years old. The indication was before IVF in 80% of cases and infertility about 20% of cases. In this study, 60% of patients has normal hysteroscopy, which is not very important. 40% of people, of women, had abnormalities and may be treated by hysteroscopy to improve fertility. Just to compare, this was a, a study which was done about 15 years ago by Bernard Blanc in Marseille, in the south of France. They compare flexible hysteroscope and saline solution, flexible hysteroscope and CO2 distension, rigid, the same size of hysteroscope, but rigid, three millimeters. Rigid and saline, rigid and CO2. Important pain. 
25% for flexible and saline. 40% for the same hysteroscope, but with CO2, because CO2 goes through the tubes and may give shoulder pain. Rigid and saline, 20%. And rigid and CO2, 26%. No pain, you may see that the most effective is flexible and saline. And after this study, we did the same in our department in Plano Hospital in 2003, 10 years ago, and we compare flexible, saline, and CO2. 1,000 cases, 500 and 500. Then the mean score of pain was flexible and saline was 2.3, which was equivalent of hysterosonography with in injection of saline solution into the uterine cavity during ultrasound. Flexible and CO2, the pain was 3.1, significantly higher. But you see that important pain is only 2% with flexible and saline solution. That's why now we are performing our whole our hysteroscopic procedure for diagnostic by a flexible hysteroscope, which is very easy. We don't need to find cervix, find the uterus. The flexible hysteroscope can go through the uterus and, sh and, and, and see what you want to see. This is the flexible hysteroscope. And we, we have a, a system to disinfection. You know, we have some machines. We are washing the, 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 the hysteroscope, and we have a ticket which is going through this machine, which is with a printer. And then you have, the, I don't know the word, the traceability? Yeah, traceability. Trace, traceability of the hysteroscope. Then, when the hysteroscope is ready, we have a nurse, but which is specialized in you see that this window is just close our office for hysteroscopy. And then she will put the hysteroscope through this room for sterilization to the couch, which is here, and we may use it immediately. What do we find in those 560 cases of infertility? We may see that if we are looking at young women the rate of, of abnormality is very low, 50%, 15%. And if we are looking older women for infertility, more than 40 years old, the rate of abnormality is about 40%. And you may see that for young patients, the most important cases are trophoblastic retention or uh, congenital abnormalities. But the older the patient are, most, mostly the, the organic lesions are more frequent. Endometrial polyps in black, submucous or intramural with the submucous part of myoma, which may be the most important cases found in patient coming for infertility. Then we think that for patient having an infertility, it's very <coughs> important to, f to sh look about her uterine cavity in order to exclude those lesions which may be very easily treated before an IVF. And if we are looking at all those abnormalities, we may see that every five, every year, you have 5% of abnormality which are present more and more every year. And we have a regular increase of the of uterine abnormalities with the time according to the age of the patient. Then we think that after 30 years old, it's uh, necessary to, re to realize a diagnostic hysteroscopy in order to exclude any uterine or endometrial pathology. Then, when we have a submucous myoma, we have to remove it. And to remove it, we think that hysteroscopy is not sufficient to, to decide to treat or not a lesion. Because the most important part is to have this mesure, this little d which is the distance between the myoma and the serosa. Mm -hmm. And for that, we need to have ultrasound. And we decide with Nicolas Perrault, which is one of my reference in, in uh, ultrasound in Paris, we decide to, to say that if the lesion is less than five millimeters to the serosa, then it's contraindication to resect by hysteroscopy this myoma. Why? Because we want to reduce perforation during the hysteroscopy reduce intravasation and reduce 
mainly the uterine rupture during future pregnancy. Then, transvaginal scanning is necessary with, with in association with diagnostic hysteroscopy, of course. And this ultrasound will measure, of course, the size of the myoma, which is intracavitary, as you see here. But we have to know what is the distance between the myoma and caesarea. Here, 5.7. Then, we may remove it. Here, same myoma, not very large, 1.6 but the distance is 0 0.6. You may remove it. Same myoma, same size, but here the distance, the distance between the myoma and serosa is 2.8. Then if you want to remove completely this myoma, during the procedure you are at 2 millimeters from the serosa, then you have a risk of uterine rupture during the procedure, <coughs> and you have a risk of intravasation of the liquid you are using for electrosurgical procedure. Then, in this case, we perform laparoscopic myomectomy and not hysteroscopic myomectomy. Then, using this specification, here you have a, an example of resection, very easy, of an interstitial myoma with a submucous part. We may see here the, the beginning of the resection, very easy. It's not, you, know, you have no bleeding. It's very important when you remove most often in a young patient who wants to preserve a fertility, it's very important to preserve the endometrium surrounding the myoma in order to, to uh, avoid any synechia or, or fibrosis, of, fibrosis of the myometrium in order to not uh, decrease the fertility rate after. Then we may see that the global results in, order, in functional results are good, 85% after resection. What is important when you remove a myoma is the interstitial part of the myoma. You see here, we are, we are finishing the resection. You see the beginning in a few seconds. And then, when you are in the deeper part of the myoma, it's very important not using electricity, but using mechanical dissection of the myoma in order to, to dissect the capsule of the myoma. You see that. We don't use electricity, and we remove the myoma, only mechanical. You have a small part here in the, in, in the deeper part of the, of the uterus, and you will see that it's in these parts that the, the vascular pattern is very important. In, when you are handling the procedure, then you may have blood. And you have, if you need, to coagulate very precisely only this uh, vessel you need, but not to coagulate everything you see. And you may see that using this method, you reduce the trauma of the myometrium, and you improve the healing process. The end of the procedure, you see that the, the endometrium has not <coughs> been removed, not been coagulized. There is no fibros fibrosis or necrosis. Using this in the last series, we, we've done about 235 myoma, which were done in, uh, I think, uh, 10 years ago. We see that the success of the procedure, if you, we res respect the size of the myoma and the distance between the myoma and the serosa, then the success rate is 96% of resection. Failure is 3%. Second step procedure in, in myoma, which are more larger than 3 centimeters, and 5% of resection in two steps. We remove the first part and the second part once the six weeks later. The hysterectomy rate is 2%. Persistence of symptoms, the 2% of hysterectomy are the same patient. What was the complication? In the first series, 280 patients, you see, I began very, very <coughs> a long time ago, 20 years ago, the perforation rate is 1%. Those perforation was only mechanical, not electrical. It's not resecting the serosa with the with the resectoscope. The main complication, the most important complication, <coughs> is resection with active electrode with electricity. You may have a perforation of, of uh, the intestine or the bladder or the rectum even. Then, the most important complication is synechia. 2.5%. And another study done in France 
shows that in Sudmak of Mayimov, they were performing post-operative office hysteroscopy, and they found 7.5% of synechia. And if you are treating a patient for myoma in, 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 in a case of infertility, it's not very useful to replace a myoma by a synechia, because synechia is worse than a myoma. Then you have to do a very precise procedure <coughs> in order to not remove the surrounding endometrium. Very important. And second, to perform an hysteroscopy one month later to separate some, uh, much, um, I don't know the word, a very subtized uh, m uh, uh, synechia we may happen, and it's very easy to separate them, even in an office procedure with a flexible hysteroscope. Then, to conclude, we think that preoperative transvaginal ultrasound is mandatory before any operative procedure, and it has been tra done by trained radiologists to precise mapping of myoma. In case of large myoma, more than 30 millimeters, patient was been informed of a possible two-step procedures. And bipolar surgery for large myoma, perhaps it <coughs> may be preferred because the introduction of liquid is less dangerous by saline solution rather than glycine solution. And third, it's very important, diagnostic hysteroscopy after one or two months after any operative procedure for infertile patient is mandatory in order to detect synechia and to preserve fertility to those young women. Thank you for your attention.